breaking news. A former LAPD officer who sexually abused one of his teenage cadets is going to prison. Former LAPD officer Robert Kane, who's already been serving time in jail on separate weapons charges, will now be spending two years. Welcome to the world of the weirdos, where the line between law and disorder gets seriously blurred. In this realm, justice sometimes wears a peculiar mask, and today, we're about to unravel the strange and twisted stories of 10 corrupt cops who found themselves in a world of trouble behind bars. It's a journey into the bizarre side of law enforcement that you won't soon forget. Number 10. Paul Razzo In the sprawling city of Los Angeles, there was a police officer named Paul Razzo. With over 25 years of service under his belt, he was a stalwart in the force, renowned for his unwavering bravery and unwavering commitment to duty. It was a career punctuated by moments of extraordinary valor, none more remarkable than the day he earned the coveted Medal of Valor. On that fateful day, Paul was on routine patrol, navigating the bustling streets of Los Angeles. But fate had something extraordinary in store for him. A violent crash and the screech of metal against asphalt drew his attention. Smoke billowed from a mangled car, and inside a man was trapped, his life hanging by a thread as flames threatened to engulf the vehicle. Without a second thought, Paul dashed into the chaos. The heat was unbearable, with the acrid smell of burning rubber and gasoline filling the air. The car's metal frame groaned as it threatened to give way, but Paul was unyielding. With every ounce of strength and determination, he fought to free the trapped man. Inch by inch, he pulled the injured soul from the clutches of the twisted wreck. Sadly, despite Paul's heroic efforts, the rescued man couldn't be saved. His injuries were too severe, but Paul's courage in the face of danger didn't go unnoticed. In July 2016, Paul was given a Medal of Valor, a symbol of his selflessness and dedication. But as it often happens in life, even heroes have their flaws. First, Paul had a rift with his girlfriend, and this ultimately led to their separation. This led to a devastating chain of events. And so, a dark cloud began to gather over Paul's otherwise illustrious career. Whispers and rumors started to circulate, stories that were too shocking to believe. Afterwards, Paul allegedly attacked not one, but four kids, two of which were his relatives, while the other two were connected to his ex. As the rumors swirled and the allegations grew more sinister, the Los Angeles Police Department had no choice but to put Paul Razzo on the dreaded wanted list. It was a shocking fall from grace for a man who had once been the epitome of courage and honor. Inevitably, the long arm of the law caught up with him. Paul was arrested, his badge and uniform replaced by the cold steel of handcuffs. The courtroom became the stage for his reckoning, where the weight of his actions bore down upon him. Ultimately, the justice system spoke, and Paul was sentenced for his transgressions. However, the story doesn't end with a sense of closure or redemption. Just a few days into his time in custody, fate took another turn, and Paul Razzo passed away, leaving behind a complex legacy of valor and the tragic shadows of his later choices. The tale of Paul Razzo is a stark reminder that even the most heroic figures can be marred by their own flaws. Number 9. Gerard John Schaefer Jr. Before Paul Rezo switched, he was a good cop, right? But you see, Gerard John Schaefer Jr. is not your regular cop. In fact, he is one of the most badass police officers ever. Born on March 25, 1946 in Wisconsin, his early life gave little hint of the chilling path he would later tread. Schaefer's aspirations to be a law-abiding citizen and to help the government led him to join the Martin County Sheriff's Office in Florida during the late 1960s, where he appeared to be a dedicated officer. But this was only for a short time, as beneath Schaefer's outward demeanor lurked a sinister transformation. Schaefer, on the surface, looked like a typical cop, but he harbored a depraved mind that he soon unleashed. He used his badge and authority to exploit young women, often targeting those he encountered while on duty, including hitchhikers. His ability to gain their trust as a law enforcement officer made his actions all the more horrifying. Between 1968 and 1972, he committed a series of heinous acts, kidnapping, torturing, and murdering numerous young women. By the time all these piled up, Schaefer already had as many as 30 victims. If there was anything he got from this act, well, that should be his nicknames. 
Schaefer became famous as a killer cop, the hangman. Many even called him the Butcher of Blind Creek. So, as evidence against Schaefer mounted, survivors' testimonies and the discovery of gruesome crime scenes began to close in on him. In 1972, two young women managed to escape his clutches and bravely reported their ordeal to the authorities. The horrifying accounts they shared led to Schaefer's arrest, and the truth about his reign of terror began to unravel. In 1973, Gerard John Schaefer found himself in a courtroom filled with people eager to see justice served. His trial laid bare the depths of his depravity, resulting in his conviction for the murders of two teenage girls, Susan Place and Georgia Jessup. He received two consecutive life sentences, effectively ending his spree of terror. And this is where the unexpected twist occurred. In the last month of 1995, while imprisoned at Florida State Prison, Schaefer met a gruesome end at the hands of a fellow inmate named Vincent Faustino Rivera. It was a brutal and shocking conclusion to a life marked by darkness and violence, leaving behind a disturbing legacy. Schaefer's transformation from a law enforcement officer to one of the most notorious criminals in American law enforcement history continues to haunt the memories of those who encountered his chilling actions. Number 8. Gennady Mikasevich For over 15 years, a single man named Gennady Mikasevich cast a dark shadow over the regions of Vitebsk, Polotsk, and the surrounding countryside in the Byelorussian SSR, a part of the Soviet Union. But who was this man? And what drove him to commit such terrible acts? In 1947, Gennady took a troubling turn in life. He had been a soldier serving in the military, but upon returning home, he faced a devastating blow. His girlfriend had left him for someone else. This heartbreak pushed Gennady to a dark place. He contemplated ending his life and even prepared a noose to hang himself. However, fate intervened when he crossed paths with a young woman on the road. Instead of taking his own life, he made a chilling decision. He would take hers channeling his anger onto an innocent victim. In October 1971, Gennady claimed another life, and a year later, he strangled two more women near Vitebsk. His murderous spree continued unabated. As time passed, Gennady decided to change his life's direction. He completed his education at a technical school in Vitebsk and returned to his hometown, even contemplating marriage. But this change in his personal life didn't mark the end of his sinister actions. The murders persisted, leaving a trail of fear and tragedy in his wake. It was as though Gennady was almost tailor-made to become a serial killer. Many of his horrific acts also involved sexual assault. His methods evolved over time. Initially, he would strangle or smother his victims in secluded places. But as time went on, Gennady began to employ a disturbing tactic. He lured his victims into his red Zaporozhets car, what makes this even more disturbing is that, due to his military training, he didn't carry conventional weapons during these attacks. Instead, he used a cord made from rye. He used this makeshift weapon to rob his victims and take the stolen valuables home to his wife as gifts. This helped conceal his dark deeds behind a facade of normalcy. On the surface, Gennady appeared to be an upstanding family man. He abstained from alcohol, was a diligent worker, held membership in the Communist Party, and even participated in the Voluntary People's Drujina. However, beneath this seemingly respectable exterior lurked a deeply troubled and dangerous individual whose actions would haunt the communities he terrorized for years. As the murders continued, investigations into these gruesome crimes gradually picked up steam. Unfortunately, many people found themselves wrongly arrested for these acts, while Gennady remained free from suspicion. It wasn't until the early 1980s that a young investigator named Nikolai Ignatovich took a firm stance. He believed that these weren't isolated cases, but the work of a single serial killer, a theory that went against the convenient presumption that there were separate murderers at play. After a series of intensive investigations, the police began to suspect that the serial killer was linked to a red Zaporozhets car. They decided to check all the people in the oblast who owned such a vehicle. Shockingly, Gennady was among those questioned, and he even assisted the police in their search. This gave him a dangerous advantage. He could learn about the investigator's steps in advance, making it easier for him to avoid suspicion. In 1985, a year that would become tragically notorious, Gennady claimed the lives of 12 women. 
Despite having many close calls, he continued his horrific spree, evading capture and keeping the region in fear. Eventually, Genity made a fatal mistake. In order to derail the investigation, he sent an anonymous letter to the local newspaper, identifying himself as Patriots of Vitebsk. After checking 556,000 samples, investigators detected that the Patriots of Vitebsk's note had a striking resemblance to the murderer's notes. A further investigation convinced investigators that the handwriting belonged to Gennady. He was finally arrested in December 1985. After initial denial, he confessed and was executed by firing squad in 1987. Number 7. Robert Fratta Let's dive into the disturbing story of Robert Fratta, a former police officer from Texas who became infamous for his involvement in a sinister crime. In 1994, Robert Fratta hatched a chilling plan. He wanted his wife, Farah Fratta, out of the picture, and he was willing to go to horrifying lengths to make it happen. Instead of carrying out the act himself, he took a dark and calculated route. He hired two individuals to carry out the gruesome task of ending his wife's life. This murder-for-hire plot was driven by a bitter custody battle over their children. Robert was determined to gain full custody, and he saw his wife as an obstacle to that goal. So he decided to eliminate her, believing it would clear his path to custody. The hired men, Joseph Wilkerson and Howard Guidry, carried out the terrible deed, taking Farah's life in a cold-blooded act of violence. However, their involvement in the crime would ultimately lead to the unraveling of Robert Fratta's sinister plan. As investigations into Farah's murder intensified, the pieces of the puzzle began to come together. Suspicion fell upon Robert, and authorities dug deeper into his involvement. It wasn't long before they uncovered the shocking truth that he had hired Wilkerson and Guidry to commit this heinous act. In 1996, Robert Fratta was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife, Farah. The evidence against him was damning, and during the trial, it became clear that he had orchestrated this terrible crime with meticulous planning. The legal proceedings ended with Fratta's conviction for capital murder, and he was sentenced to death. The case was a chilling reminder of how far someone can go when motivated by greed and a desire to eliminate obstacles in their life. However, the story takes an even more chilling turn. While on death row, Robert Fratta met a violent end himself. In 2009, he was killed by a fellow inmate. It was a shocking conclusion to a life marked by darkness and brutality, leaving behind a legacy of crime and violence that continues to haunt those who were touched by this disturbing tale. Number 6. Anthony John Sully this dude, Anthony John Sully, spent years as a Millbrae police officer until he took a dark and criminal path in the early 1980s. After leaving his job as a police officer in Millbrae, Sully started an electrical contracting business in a warehouse located in Burlingame. However, this warehouse wasn't used for electrical work. It became Sully's sinister hideout. Inside this warehouse, Sully committed unspeakable acts of torture and violence against prostitutes. His first victim was a 24-year-old woman named Gloria Jean Fravel. She was brought to the warehouse by Tina Livingston, who ran an escort service and had crossed paths with Sully in 1982. The reason for Fravel's horrific ordeal was related to money. Reportedly, Fravel owed Livingston $500. Alongside another sex worker named Kelly Angel Burns, Livingston brought Fravel to Sully's warehouse. Astonishingly, the torture took place inside the warehouse over the course of a weekend, all while Livingston and Burns pretended that nothing out of the ordinary was happening. The horrifying spree of murders carried on, with Sully using Livingston to lure in his victims. Another victim was a 19-year-old named Brenda Oakden, who had only worked for Livingston's escort service once. By this point, Sully seemed unstoppable and unfazed by his terrible actions. To conceal his crimes, Sully took a gruesome approach. He placed the bodies of his victims into metal drums and filled them with concrete. However, as time passed, the smell from these barrels became a problem. So, he decided to seek advice on how to get rid of them. Eventually, Sully resorted to dumping these gruesome barrels in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. But his reign of terror couldn't continue without consequences. Detectives launched an investigation into Sully's warehouse. Inside, 
they discovered a crucial piece of evidence, Sully's fingerprints on the barrels. This led to his arrest, and during the courtroom proceedings, even more disturbing aspects of Sully's personality were revealed. During the trial, Livingston, who had been involved with Sully, testified that Sully had once told her that the police had the authority to kill people. This revelation shed light on his twisted mindset. Ultimately, the court found Sully guilty of his heinous crimes, and on June 1986, he received a death sentence. Throughout his sentencing, Sully maintained that he hadn't received a fair trial. He directly addressed the judge, saying, I am not a monster, not a maniac, not subhuman. This phase of the story highlights the shocking details that emerged during Sully's trial, painting a picture of a deeply troubled individual who committed terrible acts and tried to defend himself in court. After 37 years on San Quentin's death row, Sully eventually died at the prison's rehabilitation center. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. In the world of law enforcement, there are often stories that defy our expectations. Take, for instance, this captivating image of a woman donned in a police uniform, but with a startling twist an oversized chain tightly wrapped around her neck, almost as if she's the one under arrest. As we delve deeper into this arresting image, we're left with more questions than answers. What led this officer, sworn to uphold the law, to find herself in such a predicament? Was it a symbol of her own battle against the corruption that might have surrounded her, a metaphorical shackle to the very system she was meant to serve? Perhaps this arresting officer was a whistleblower, a lone sentinel within the ranks, fighting against the tides of misconduct. Or maybe, on the contrary, she had succumbed to the allure of corruption, and this chain serves as a haunting reminder of her transgressions. In this enigmatic visual, we find a powerful narrative of a cop caught in the crossfire of justice and corruption, leaving us to wonder where her allegiance truly lies and what circumstances brought her to this intriguing juncture in her law enforcement career. Now, over to you. What do you think about this image? Share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. Number 5. Flores Valdo de Oliveira Flores Valdo de Oliveira, famously known as Cabo Bruno, is a name etched into the dark annals of Brazilian crime history. His story is one of controversy, violence, and an ultimate tragic end. Cabo's notoriety arose from his role as a former officer of the military police of Sao Paulo State, accused of being a vigilante and serial killer during the tumultuous 1980s on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. One of the most striking aspects of Cabo's case is the sheer number of murders he was accused of committing, over 50, to be precise. This placed him among the most prolific alleged killers in the region during that tumultuous decade. His actions earned him a reputation as one of the most controversial characters in the police chronicle. What makes Cabo's story even more perplexing is the roller coaster of admissions and denials. Initially, he admitted to being involved in these numerous deaths, which sent shockwaves through the public and law enforcement. However, as his legal proceedings unfolded, Cabo took a stunning turn. Cabo was apprehended on September 22, 1983. During his court hearing, he claimed innocence for his murder charges. Cabo's luck took a new dimension when he was found guilty and handed a hefty sentence of 113 years behind bars. But as fate would have it, he managed to catch a break, securing his release after serving 27 years behind those prison walls. At this point, it seemed he was free, but far from it. Cabo encountered another day of terror in 2012, just over a month after his release from prison. On September 26th of that year, as he was returning from a religious service in Aparecida, accompanied by his relatives, he met a horrifying end. In the Quadra Coberta neighborhood of Pindamonhangaba, Cabo was gunned down in a hail of 18 to 20 bullets, leaving him dead on the spot. Astonishingly, his relatives, who were with him during this violent encounter, escaped unharmed. The circumstances of Cabo's death raise numerous questions, adding yet another layer of complexity to his enigmatic life. Who were the assailants responsible for his violent end, and what motivated such a gruesome act? These questions linger, forming part of the enduring mystery surrounding these controversial former police officer. Flores Valdo de Oliveira's story is one of darkness, crime, and a tumultuous journey through the legal system. 
It's a chilling reminder of how one individual's actions can leave a lasting mark on the history of crime, shaking a community to its core. Number 4. Ted Dyer In the realm of crime and punishment, there are stories that are both harrowing and complex, and the tale of Ted Dyer is one such story. He was a former Muskegon County Airport police officer who found himself entangled in a web of darkness and criminality. The ordeal began when Ted Dyer was convicted of first-degree criminal sexual assault on a nine-year-old girl in December 2013. The gravity of his crime shook the community, and rightfully so. The conviction came with a 25 to 50 jail sentence, ensuring that Dyer would pay for his disturbing actions. But in the world of prisons, this sentence can take on a macabre twist of its own. Less than a year after receiving his jail term, Dyer's existence came to a violent and abrupt end, right there behind prison walls. It was his cellmate, Stephen Sanderson, who wielded the hand of death. 51-year-old Sanderson at the time took a shocking step. He calmly and politely explained his motive for taking another person's life. Dyer, the man who had sexually assaulted a nine-year-old girl, was now dead at the hands of his fellow inmate. The details surrounding Dyer's death and the circumstances that led to it would undoubtedly raise eyebrows and prompt uncomfortable questions about justice within the prison system. For the mother of the young girl who had suffered the unthinkable, this news must have unleashed a storm of emotions. It was a bittersweet revelation. On one hand, it brought a sense of closure, knowing that Dyer could never hurt another innocent soul. On the other hand, it served as a stark reminder of the painful chapter her family had endured due to Dyer's actions. Ted Dyer's journey from a corrupt cop to a convicted child molester ended in a prison cell, and it was there that he met his own grim fate. His story serves as a chilling reminder of the consequences that individuals face when they cross the line into criminality and the complex dynamics that can unfold within the walls of a correctional facility. In the end, the story of Ted Dyer is a dark, cautionary tale that underscores the enduring impact of criminal actions on victims and their families. It leaves us with a sobering lesson about the complexities of justice, both inside and outside the courtroom, and the often unpredictable paths that stories of crime and punishment can take. Number 3. Robert Kane. Richard Kane's career is a haunting example of the transformation from a promising police officer to a figure entrenched in corruption, eventually leading to a violent and mysterious end. Kane began his journey in law enforcement with a sense of duty and dedication. He joined the Los Angeles Police Department with aspirations of making his city safer. As a young officer, he might have been seen as a beacon of hope, upholding the law and protecting the citizens he served. However, this image would soon be shattered. The turning point in Kane's career came when he became entangled with organized crime, specifically the notorious Los Angeles outfit. As he became increasingly involved with criminal elements, his moral compass seemed to erode. He transitioned from being a guardian of the law to a participant in illegal activities. One of the darkest chapters in Kane's career was his alleged involvement in sexual assault of a 15-year-old cadre. Similarly, he was rumored to have connections to organized crime figures, possibly serving as their inside man within the police force. This collaboration led to suspicions of corruption, bribery, and misconduct. Unfortunately, the full extent of Kane's illicit activities remains shrouded in secrecy. Corruption within the police force can have far-reaching consequences, and the details of his involvement might never be fully known. Tragically, Richard Kane's descent into corruption led him to a brutal end. In a fate that could be straight out of a crime novel, he was gunned down under mysterious circumstances. The circumstances surrounding his murder remain clouded in uncertainty, with speculations of a power struggle within the criminal underworld. The details of his murder are as enigmatic as his transformation into a corrupt cop. Some believe it was the result of internal conflicts within the police department, fearing Kane might cooperate with law enforcement. Others suggest it was a power play within the criminal hierarchy. Richard Kane's life and career serve as a haunting reminder of the dangers of corruption within law enforcement. What might have been a promising career in the service of justice ended in a tangled web of secrecy and violence. His story is a cautionary tale, 
illustrating the destructive path that can unfold when a police officer strays from the path of integrity and honor. Number 2. John Burge When we delve into the annals of law enforcement history, there emerges a name that remains etched in infamy, John Burge. His story is a stark reminder of the damage that can be inflicted when a cop goes rogue. In the beginning, Burge started as an ordinary police officer, perhaps with dreams of making his city a safer place. He was part of the Chicago Police Department, entrusted with upholding the law and protecting the rights of citizens. But somewhere along the way, his path took a sinister twist. The turning point came when Burge became embroiled in a deeply disturbing practice, the torture of suspects to extract false confessions. This horrific behavior wasn't just about bending the rules. It was about breaking them in the most brutal way possible. Imagine being a suspect, picked up by the police, and then subjected to torture by the very officers who were supposed to serve and protect. This is the nightmare that many individuals faced at the hands of John Burge and his team. They used shocking methods like electric shocks, suffocation, and physical abuse to force confessions, often from innocent people. The consequences of these actions were devastating. Innocent individuals were imprisoned for crimes they didn't commit, their lives forever altered by the horrors they endured in police custody. The very fabric of trust between the police and the community was torn apart. Justice finally caught up with John Burge, but not for the horrific acts of torture itself. Instead, he was convicted of perjury and obstruction of justice, which are legal ways of saying he lied and covered up his wrongdoings. In 2010, he was sentenced to four and a half years in prison. Burge's case wasn't just about one bad cop. It was about a systemic failure within the Chicago Police Department. The revelations of torture and abuse sent shockwaves through the criminal justice system, leading to the release of wrongfully convicted individuals and a painful reckoning for the city. John Burge's story is a dark chapter in the history of law enforcement. It serves as a reminder of the importance of transparency, accountability, and maintaining the highest ethical standards within the police force. It also underscores the resilience of those who fought for justice, even when it seemed like the odds were stacked against them. Number 1. Ferdy Sambo Ferdy Sambo's journey from a high-ranking police officer to a controversial figure has indeed raised concerns about his conduct and ethics within the police force. Sambo, who once held the prestigious position of a two-star general and headed the Internal Affairs Department of the police force, found himself at the center of a deeply troubling case. His department was typically responsible for investigating misconduct and breaches of the law within the police ranks, making the allegations against Sambo even more disturbing. The core of the issue revolved around a tragic shooting incident. It's reported that Sambo's aide-de-camp, Nofriancia Yosua Hutabarat, allegedly committed a heinous act against Sambo's wife, Putri Kandrawathi. What followed was a chain of events that has led to serious questions about Sambo's integrity. When Sambo confronted Hutabarat about the alleged assault on his wife, the situation escalated rapidly. Some claimed that Hutabarat fired multiple shots at Sambo and his security team, including a young police brigadier named Richard Eliezer Pudihang Lumiu. This act of aggression raises significant concerns about Sambo's involvement. In response to the perceived threat, Lumiu, a member of Sambo's security team, reportedly discharged the fatal shots that ended Hutabarat's life. The question then arises, did Sambo use his authority to cover up any wrongdoing on his part or that of his team? The case became even more complex as conflicting narratives emerged. While Sambo, Kandrawathi, and two others present at the scene steadfastly claimed that they had acted in self-defense, the prosecution painted a wholly different picture. These contrasting accounts have left many wondering about the transparency and integrity of Sambo's actions and whether there may have been any attempts to manipulate the truth. As legal proceedings continue, Ferdy Sambo's reputation as a former high-ranking police officer now carried the weight of allegations and controversies. The gravity of the charges against him and the conflicting accounts of the events have led to skepticism about his conduct and actions as a police officer. In the eyes of many, 
Sambo's case serves as a stark reminder of the importance of maintaining the highest ethical standards and transparency within law enforcement agencies, regardless of one's rank or position. In the preceding court case, Sambo was sentenced to death for destroying evidence relevant to the case. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.